In the last six months, I have held major evangelistic meetings in Brazil via satellite from the capital city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, we have 700 Seventh-day Adventist churches in that one city and 180,000 Seventh-day Adventists. We held evangelistic meetings in Cuba recently, and God opened some unusual doors for the first time in history in the city of Santiago de Cuba, the second largest city in all of Cuba, we were able to use a public auditorium and the Lord worked on the hearts of communist officials in Cuba. You know, the Bible says the, hand of the, Pharaoh, the, the heart of the Pharaoh is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he would. I watched God change the minds of communist officials in Cuba to allow us to have a public auditorium and 2,000 people flocked into the evangelistic meetings. Recently, we were in Monterrey, Mexico, where we had the largest auditorium and the most beautiful auditorium in all of Inter and South America, and 10 to 12,000 people came out every night to the meetings. We've seen the unusual stirring, the unusual moving of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you two brief stories before we enter into our meeting tonight on how the Holy Spirit moves. And these stories indicate to me that when God moves, unusual things happen. In Monterey, Mexico, a very beautiful and affluent city, there was a man who had many, many problems in his life. He had financial problems, health problems, marriage problems, and he became extremely discouraged and disappointed with himself and with his life. He decided to end his life, but before he did, he wanted to take a walk and just uh, bring the gun with him and put the gun up to his head and blow out his brains when he came to a quiet place in a park in that city. When he walked out of his house, he noticed across the street from his house a billboard with large letters that said, there is hope. And he looked at that billboard, there is hope, Monterey Arena. And he said, that's foolishness. First, there is no hope, and if there was, I could never get it anyway. He continued walking down the street with his head down, filled with depression. A bus passed by, and the bus had a placard on it that said, there is hope. He said, what is going on here? He walked by the Monterey Arena, and there was a billboard in front that said, and he thought, somebody is trying to give me a message. He walked into the Monterey Arena and did not get there until I was giving an altar call. The meeting was over. I had preached the sermon. As he was standing with 12,000 others in the entryway, the first sentence he heard out of my hope mouth was, there is hope. Somebody here tonight is discouraged. Somebody here tonight may be thinking of taking their life, but there is hope. He stood there stunned. He said, that man is talking to me. I said, Jesus can give you hope. Whatever your discouragement, whatever your disappointment, Jesus can give you hope. I made an appeal. He heard two minutes of preaching, and it changed his whole life. He came forward, knelt at the altar, cried his eyes out. Our pastors got their arms around him, started studying the Bible with them. Every Sabbath, that man is in church today. He has found Jesus. He's accepted Sabbath. He now is fellowshipping with Adventists as part of the family. God, through his Holy Spirit, looked down on that man. I was preaching in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Talk about the Holy Spirit. A Adventist cab driver who only spoke Portuguese brought up to me, a, up to introduce me to a man by the name of Chris. And uh, Chris knew English and Portuguese, so he had to translate what the Brazilian cab driver who was the Adventist was saying. Chris was not an Adventist. 
And so, as Chris interpreted for this cab driver, I got the story. Chris is an American economist. He travels between the United States and Brazil in the money market field. As Chris flew into the airport, this Adventist, econ this Adventist taxi driver picked him up. The Adventist taxi driver developed a relationship with Chris over a number of times from picking him up at the airport. He didn't pick him up once, he picked him up multiple times. The subject came around to religion, world history. Chris had been a Catholic but had left the Catholic Church. After many, many discussions, the Adventist taxi driver invited Chris to our evangelistic meetings. Chris came. Chris and I began to talk. Chris said to me, Mark, where are you from in the United States? I said, I was uh, born in Connecticut. Where are you from? He said, oh, uh, I uh, am from Connecticut as well. Uh, he said, where did you go to high school? I said, Connecticut. He said, I went to high school in Connecticut. Uh, I said, I went to Catholic schools for much of my life before I really became an Adventist, found Jesus. He said, well, I went to Catholic schools too. He said, what Catholic school did you go to? I said, St. Patrick's Catholic School in Norwich, Connecticut. He said, we moved to New York when I was a child after being born in Connecticut, and I lived across the street from St. Patrick's Catholic Church. I said, that's where my father lived. I said, where are you living now? He said, Florida. My wife's there in Florida. I said, well, my wife's in Florida right now too. <laughs> now, I want you to tell me the odds that an economist from the United States would be picked up by a taxi driver who's an Adventist, brought to an Adventist evangelistic meeting, and that economist was born in Connecticut, the evangelist was born in Connecticut, that economist had a Catholic background, the evangelist had a Catholic background, that economist went to Catholic schools, the evangelists went to Catholic schools, they lived in Connecticut at approximately the same time and their both wives were in Florida. That economist accepted Jesus Christ on the Sabbath during our meetings. And we've invited him to our next series, October 24 to November 29, which is going to be via satellite all across North America. And I know your churches and your homes will be picking it up. And he will be coming from Orlando, Florida. The Holy Spirit is working powerfully in our world. Over the next four evenings and on Sabbath morning, we're going to be talking about Thursday night, Friday night, Sabbath night, and Sabbath morning, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Tonight I'm discussing receiving the Spirit. Receiving the Spirit. Tomorrow evening I'm going to talk about strange fire on church altars. The difference between the reception of the Holy Spirit and the difference between that and Satan's counterfeit of the Spirit. Many churches and Christians will be deceived by Satan in the last days and accept what they think is the Holy Spirit only to be deceived by the spirit of demons. How can you tell the difference between the genuine and counterfeit manifestation of the Holy Spirit? But more yet, how can your heart be open to receive the fullness of God's Spirit? We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Sabbath morning, Pentecost repeated. When will God pour out his Spirit with Pentecostal power like he did in the book of Acts? Saturday night, Sabbath evening, we'll talk about end-time symbols of the Spirit, wind, rain, water, and fire. You'll want to come praying, bringing your Bibles with you each evening. Now let's pray as we enter into our topic for tonight as we go to the screen, receiving the Spirit. Father in heaven, our great hearts long for the reception of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. We are powerless to face Satan without it. We are powerless to witness to the world without it. And we pray thee, Lord, that this would be more than an intellectual academic exercise. This would be more than something that we learn something to share with others. But we pray that during these next four meetings that your spirit would be poured out on our hearts. We would be changed men and women. In Christ's name, amen. I had just finished a series of meetings on the Holy Spirit, and an elderly gentleman came up to me. He said, Pastor Mark, I have a question for you. Do you have time to answer it? I said, certainly. He began to quote a number of Bible texts. I knew immediately that this elderly gentleman was quite knowledgeable about the Bible, but I couldn't quite figure out where he was going in his questioning. He kind of beat around the bush, and then he asked me this question. 
Is the Holy Spirit a power flowing from God as some sort of impersonal influence, or is the Holy Spirit a divine person? He said, Mark, I'd really be interested in knowing the answer to that question. And then he asked, what is your opinion? Is the Holy Spirit a force? Is the Holy Spirit some kind of impersonal influence? Is the, or is the Holy Spirit a person? Is the Holy Spirit a power? Now, I said to that gentleman, how you answer that question makes all the difference in the world. Because if the Holy Spirit is the divine third person of the Godhead and you treat him as a force, you do not give the divine third person of the Godhead the respect and honor and power, honor, the respect and honor that the Godhead deserves. Then I said something else to him. If the Holy Spirit is a mere influence or power, we're likely to try to grasp this power and use it for our own selfish desires. So you see, if the Holy Spirit is no more than a power, if the Holy Spirit is no more than a force, then our goal will be to try to grasp that power, grasp that force, and use it. But if the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, then we bow before him as we do the Father and the Son with open hearts, inviting the Holy Spirit to transform our lives, convict us of sin, teach us of truth. As you study the Gospel of John, more than 24 times in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is referred to as him, not in it. A him or the third person pronoun, he or him is used of the Holy Spirit. The false concept of the Holy Spirit as merely a power or force leads, as you notice it on the screen, it leads to self-exaltation. It leads to egotism, wanting to use this force or this power. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is one of the most neglected truths in all of Christendom. That's why we need to spend four nights, four periods, that is, studying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that during the next four presentations, that the power of the living Christ will come down on the Michigan camp meeting. I pray that throughout this campground, little groups will be gathering in their trailers, in their RVs, and little groups be gathering under the trees, and little groups be gathering in the classrooms to pray and seek the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a neglected truth. Dr. Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, a man I became acquainted with shortly before his death, my wife and I visited in Dr. Bright's home, a great Christian leader who initiated Campus Crusade for Christ. Campus Crusade for Christ took a survey of Christians throughout the United States and around the world. And sadly, this is what they discovered. Nearly 95% of the respondents have indicated that they have little knowledge of who the Holy Spirit is or why the Holy Spirit exists. What a sad thought. In his book, The Secret of How to Live with Purpose and Power, page 34, Dr. Bright says this. He says, I'm personally convinced that if today's Christians better understood the Bible's basic teaching about the Holy Spirit and in, then invited him to release his power in their lives each day, they would experience unprecedented joy and personal fulfillment. More than that, our verbal and nonverbal witness for Christ would sweep the world. Do you want unprecedented joy in your Christian life? Do you want new power in your Christian life? Do you want to have a witness that makes a difference in other people's lives? The secret is the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer, a great man of God and a spiritual giant of a few generations ago, wrote this. The idea of the spirit held by the average church member is so vague that it is nearly non-existent. God longs that we understand the ministry of the spirit and experience that ministry in our lives. All of heaven's power is waiting to be poured out on a final generation. 
Would you like to experience unprecedented joy in your Christian life? Have you been downhearted? Have you been discouraged? The Spirit can give you new joy. Would you like to receive Christ's supernatural power to live a victorious Christian life? Have you been, have you been struggling with anger? Have you been struggling with bitterness? Have you been struggling with lust? Have you been str struggling with envy and gossip and criticism? Could it be that it's because you have been trying to live the Christian life in your own power? That's what happened to Tim. Tim was brought up in a Christian home. But for him, Christianity seemed to be a burden. It seemed to be a yoke. He seemed not to be able to deal with the sins of his life until he came to a seminar on the Holy Spirit. And he saw that he was living the Christian life by gritting his teeth and trying to do battle with the devil. He saw that he was living the Christian life in human power. At that seminar, for the first time in his life, he opened his heart and mind to the power of the Holy Spirit. And he experienced life-transforming power. You can experience life-transforming power. Would you like to be a powerful witness to the world? Maybe you try to witness. You give out literature. You give a Bible study. You try to share Jesus, but not much happens. Is it because you're doing it in your own strength? Is it because there is a lack of spirit in the life? Understanding who the Holy Spirit is and receiving him into your life is the key to a fulfilled Christian life. If you want power in your Christian life, the key is the Holy Spirit. If you want new love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, Galatians 5, the, the key is the Holy Spirit. If you want a power to witness, the key is the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Jesus said? You shall be witnesses unto me when the Holy Spirit is upon you, and you shall be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. First, who is the Holy Spirit? Tonight we're going to look at some basic things about the Holy Spirit. Tonight we're going to look at who is the Holy Spirit, how do you receive the Holy Spirit, and what does the Holy Spirit want to do in your life? Then tomorrow night, we'll look at strange fire on church altars, the true and false manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, is the Holy Spirit a person? Will we see the Holy Spirit in heaven? Will we see the Father in heaven? Will we see the Son in heaven? Will we see the Holy Spirit in heaven? Does the Holy Spirit have a physical form? Now, you see, often we equate personality with visibility. We say, if you can't see it, it really doesn't exist as a divine person. We often equate divine personality with visibility. And what we try to do is put into the narrowness of our minds eternal dimensions and divine truths. Now, thinking of the Holy Spirit, because we can't see the Spirit, thinking of the Holy Spirit as a force, merely because the Holy Spirit may not have visibility to us now, rather than a divine being, is a human attempt to explain divine things. At times, we forget that what? God is God. And it's not always possible to understand everything about the nature of the Holy Spirit. But because we cannot understand everything about the nature of the Holy Spirit does not mean that the Holy Spirit is not a divine personality, not a divine personage like the Father and the Son. Neither does it mean that we cannot understand the working of the Holy Spirit because we may not understand everything about his nature. One early Christian said this, to try to understand the Trinity is to lose one's mind. To deny the Trinity is to lose one's what? Soul. The Father is divine, the Son is divine, and the Holy Spirit is divine. The Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty. The Father is all-knowing, the Son is all-knowing, the Holy Spirit is all-knowing. The Bible teaches that you don't have to understand everything about something to appreciate the something you don't know everything about. Right? You don't have to understand everything about something to appreciate the something you don't know everything about. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that here's a PhD 
in the University of Michigan, that esteemed, renowned university. This PhD is a cornologist. You know what a cornologist is. He studies sweet corn. I just made that one up. They got every other ologist. You might as well have a cornologist, right? That was kind of corny. You missed it. Your wife will explain it later. Anyway, all right. Here's this cornologist. He knows everything about corn. He did his PhD in the 17th kernel on the fifth row from the left. I mean, he specializes in corn kernels. He knows every vitamin, every mineral, every amino acid in the corn. Then he goes to a corn roast and he eats sweet corn. But here is an illiterate native in the jungles of Brazil who eats sweet corn. He doesn't even know what a vitamin is. He never heard of an amino acid. And he certainly doesn't know about lysine and riboflavin. He doesn't know anything about corn. All he knows is it tastes good. Now here's my question to you. Who is going to get more vitamins and minerals and amino acids from the corn? The cornologist that eats it at a Michigan corn roast who has his PhD in cornology or the poor guy who can't read and write and eats it in the jungles of Brazil. Who gets more vitamin and minerals? Who gets more? Now I have another question for you. Who would get more vitamins and minerals? Let's suppose the cornologist only studied it and never ate it. And he knows everything about it. Who's going to get more vitamins and minerals? The guy in the jungle who eats it or the other guy who studies about it? You don't have to know everything about something to get the benefit of the something you don't know everything about. You and I may not know everything about the Holy Spirit, but we can open our hearts and minds to Jesus and say, Jesus, come into my heart with your Holy Spirit. It doesn't necessarily depend on the brilliance of your mind as it does the receptivity of an open heart. Thinking of the Holy Spirit as a force because I can't get my mind around it is a human attempt to explain divine things. Now also, thinking of the Holy Spirit as a force is contrary to the Bible. Now, there are three extremely plain New Testament passages that I'd like to look at. There are many more. But I want tonight to be clear on who the Holy Spirit is so that we'll understand how to receive the Holy Spirit. There are multiple passages in the New Testament that describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But let's look at three. Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit is crystal clear. Jesus was not ambiguous on this Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Let's read it together. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In that Bible passage, does Jesus himself make the Holy Spirit lesser than the Father and the Son? Does he? Is the Father a divine personality? Is the Father real? Is the Son a divine personality? Is he real? Is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, real? Is the Holy Spirit more than a force? Certainly more than a force. Is the Holy Spirit more than an influence? Certainly. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Notice Ephesians 2 verse 18, reading together. Through him, that is who... Christ, we have access by one Spirit into the Father. Notice you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the same Bible passage. Throughout the Scripture, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cooperate together to accomplish heaven's purposes in the plan of redemption. Consistently through the Bible, where you see the Father, you also see the Son and the Holy Spirit. Consistently through the Bible, that is true. For example, at creation, who created the world? Who created the world? 
Who created the world? Well, somebody said the Father, somebody said the Son, and somebody said the Holy Spirit, and I said amen. <laughs> the Bible says, Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning what? God created heaven and earth. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, God created all things by what? Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep. Who created the earth? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as a unity created. Now, think of when Jesus is baptized. When Jesus is baptized, the Bible says, Jesus being baptized, the Bible says, the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm what? Well, please. Then the Bible says the Spirit of God came down upon him. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were present. Another question. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Did Jesus say in John chapter 10, verse 18 and onward, I lay down my life and I will what? Raise it up again. So who raised Jesus? Jesus had the power to lay down his life and he had the power to what? Raise it up. But wait a minute, I'm a little confused here because my Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that uh, he was raised up by the Holy Spirit. But then when Peter was preaching in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 24, he says God raised him from the dead. The unknowledgeable would say that Bible contradicts itself. Because Jesus said, I can lay down my life and raise it up. Romans 2 says the Holy Spirit raised him up. And uh, Acts chapter 2 says that, Romans 8 rather, verse 11 says that the Holy Spirit raised him up. And Acts chapter 2 about verse 24 says that God raised him up. See, the unknowledgeable do not understand that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit act cooperatively. So the praise we give to the Father, we give to the Son and the Holy Spirit. The openness of our heart that we give to the Father occurs as the Spirit lives within us. So when you study Scripture, in the Old Testament, in Scripture, the Father is in center stage. In the New Testament, Jesus is in center stage. But once Jesus ascends to heaven, he sends his Holy Spirit, who is in center stage in this generation, to witness of the Father and the Son. So our hearts are open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Read it together with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Did you notice three things in that passage? What did you notice there? God's love, Christ's grace, and the Holy Spirit's communion. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the divine trinity that work together. But today, it's the Holy Spirit that reveals Jesus to us. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us about the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in our lives. Christianity is not gritting your teeth and clenching your fists and saying, I know I'm going to be good enough if it kills me to get into heaven. Christianity is opening your heart to the Holy Spirit and letting Jesus do inside of you what you never dreamed you could do yourself. It is through the Spirit that we enter into intimate communion with the divine. It's understanding the indwelling of the Spirit that enables us to have the most intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is a divine person, the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is just as real, just as much a divine person, just as much member of the Godhead as the Father or the Son. Testimony Series B, number 7, page 62 and 63. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. Notice how Ellen White puts it. She is very clear. There are three living persons persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life for, in Christ. It is through the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in us that we can live new life in Christ. Leroy Froome wrote a book called The Coming of the Comforter. Page 41, he says this, Jesus was the most marked and influential personality ever in this old world. And the Holy Spirit was to supply his vacated place. No one but a person could take the place of this wondrous person. No mere influence would ever suffice. 
when you kneel down at your bed tonight, say, dear Jesus, you promised that your Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, would enter my heart and life and enable me to live a happy, joyous, productive Christian life that would enable me to be a powerful witness. Lord, I claim that promise. The promise of the Holy Spirit is yours. If you're discouraged tonight, the promise of the Spirit to give joy is yours. If you feel weak tonight, the promise of the Holy Spirit to give you strength is yours. If you feel powerless to overcome tonight lust, anger, and bitterness, the promise of the Spirit is yours. If you've tried to witness and failed, the promise of the Spirit is yours. Testimonies to Ministers, page 392. Evil had been accumulating for centuries. Has it, my brother? Has it, my sister? Has evil been accumulating for centuries? Yes, but listen. And could only be restrained. Could what? Only. What's only mean? Only is only because if only wouldn't be only if it was something. Only means only. And could only be restrained by what? What's the next? By the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want power in your life? Evil can only be restrained not by a human attempt to overcome evil, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the mighty power, the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy. Take that promise. Lord, I want the mighty power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Lord, I don't want it to come in modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. How many of you tonight want to say, Lord, I want the fullness of divine power? The fullness of divine power. Not modified energy. Lord, I want to be everything I can be for you in the kingdom. We live in a world where seeing is believing. The secular, materialistic, postmodern world says, if you can't see it, if you can't touch it, if you can't feel it, it does not exist. The secular, materialistic world says, if you can't touch it, if it's not material, if you can't quantify it, the idea is it does not exist. But the things of the Spirit are far beyond the secular mind of this world. The Holy Spirit is real, and He can make a real change in your life and mine. Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit is absolutely life-transforming. Jesus said, John 14, verse 16 and 17, let's read it together. He was going to leave, and He said to His disciples, let's read together, I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Continue. Because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus said, the world will not understand this, because the world simply focuses on that which is material. But Jesus said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead. And He is going to live in you, inside of you. He's going to live and give you a new peace in your life, a new joy in your life, a new sense of fulfillment in your life, a new sense of purpose in your life. He is going to fill you up. He's going to give you a new sense of victory over sin and evil in your life. He's going to give you power to witness. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit that God has led left the church, the first and second person of the Godhead, the Father and the Son. Now, don't miss this. This is marvelous. Let your mind grasp it. The Father and the Son take up residence in our hearts through the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Jesus fills us with His personal presence through His Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said to His disciples, it is necessary for you that I go away. In fact, the one translation of the Bible says, it is to your advantage that I go away. Have you ever wished, oh, I wish that Jesus would walk into this camp meeting tonight. I just wish He'd walk through those back doors. I wish I could sit down and talk with Jesus. I wish He'd just embrace me. I wish He'd just whisper encouragement in my ear. Jesus said to the disciples, There is something more important than my personal presence. 
That is the infilling and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to leave earth, but you will be able to have a more intimate relationship with me through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit than you could have if I were here alone. Notice, Steps to Christ, page 74 and 75. Pentecost brought them the presence of the Comforter, of whom Christ had said, He shall be in you, and he had further said, It is expedient, necessary, or to your advantage for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. So Ellen White is quoting this passage. Notice, she's quoting this statement of Jesus, and she's commenting on it and expanding it, where Jesus said it's expedient or necessary that I go away. Then she says, henceforth through the Spirit, Christ was, continually, was to abide continually in the hearts of his children. Now pick up the reading with me and read the next sentence together. Their union with him was closer than when he was personally with them. The union of the disciples with Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was closer than if Jesus were with them personally. There is an advantage that you have that you may not have yet considered. You may have been living the Christian life with frustrated defeat. You may have been living the Christian life with a casual experience, not fully grasping, understanding, or recognizing that you can have a more intimate relationship with Jesus through the ministry of the Holy Spirit than you could have if Jesus, than if Jesus were here personally. My heart longs for that experience. I long for the indwelling. I long for the infilling of the Spirit. It's as if restraint was holding back the Spirit. But God in this generation wants to pour the Spirit out upon the church and have us transformed by the grace of God. Jesus Christ is not waiting for 492 more earthquakes and 748 more tornadoes. And He is not waiting for the stock market to crash. He is not waiting for an economic disaster. He is not waiting at all for more Hurricane Katrinas. He's longing for his people to open their hearts, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to represent his love to the world, and take the gospel to a dying generation. And without that spirit, all the technology in the world is not going to finish the work of God on earth. Jesus longs to manifest himself in your life and mine more intimately. Now, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? in our lives. What will God do through His Spirit for you and for me? What does this precious heavenly gift desire to do for each follower of Jesus Christ? Review and Herald, November 29, 1892. The work of the Holy Spirit is what? What, everybody? Immeasurably great. It is from this source that power and efficiency come to the work for God. And the Holy Spirit is the comforter as the personal presence of Christ to the soul. So the Holy Spirit is the personal presence of Christ in my soul. He brings to me efficiency as a worker for God. He brings to me power. And the work of the Holy Spirit is immeasurably great. What is Jesus longing to do through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now there are three things that I want to look at you, look with you at tonight. First, the Holy Spirit is our personal helper. If you have your Bible, please take it and turn to the book of John. And you'll notice it there in the 14th chapter of the book of John, the 16th verse. John chapter 14, verse 16. Notice what it says. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. So first thing Jesus says is the Holy Spirit is our helper. Now that word helper in the New Testament Greek language, and the New Testament was written in the Greek language, is paraclete. Paraclete. What does that word mean? It means one who comes alongside of. One who comes alongside of to give assistance or help. So when you're discouraged, the Holy Spirit 
is the divine helper. He's the divine paraclete. He comes alongside of you to give you courage. When you have failed again and again and again, and you say, Jesus, I can't make it. Jesus, Jesus, I can never be saved because I've sinned and I'm filled with guilt. It is the Holy Spirit that has brought that guilt to your mind as the divine helper so you can see who you are. But this divine helper gives us new eyes to see so we can see Jesus and our lives transformed. The Holy Spirit is the divine helper. Do you need help? Do you need courage? Do you need hope? Do you need peace? Do you need strength? Do you need victory? We are not in this thing alone. There is a divine, what everybody? Helper. Do you need help tonight? Help with your children. There is a divine helper. Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts as you pray. Where do you need help tonight? Has that lump in your breast been diagnosed as a malignancy and you are frightened about death? Open your heart to the divine helper and Jesus will come and give you new hope. Have you failed on the same thing again and again and again? You wished you wouldn't, but you did. There is a divine helper. He is called to our side for the purpose of helping where we fail. He's called to our side for the purpose of lifting us up. Jesus himself experienced the full gamut of human pain and emotional trauma. There's nothing that you and I can go through that Jesus has not gone through. You say, wait a minute, Jesus never went through a divorce. I was 46 years old, had three children. My husband left me for somebody else. Jesus never went through that. Jesus was rejected in a way you will never understand. Because the deeper your capacity to love, the greater your capacity to experience pain. And Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Jesus was betrayed by Peter. And when Jesus hung on that cross, he felt a deeper pain of betrayal than you could ever imagine with a husband leaving you. You say, wait a minute. Jesus never experienced the pangs of a heroin addict. But wait a minute. Jesus fasted for 40 days and in the physical fast had greater desire to eat than any heroin addict could possibly understand. You see, in the physical, mental, spiritual areas, the emotional areas, whatever you have experienced, Jesus has gone to the depths of that. So when he says he can come alongside and help you through the Holy Spirit, what Jesus is saying is this. I know the pain you go through. I know the sorrow and disappointment. I know your longing for help. And I will send my Holy Spirit who fully identifies with every emotional, physical, and mental anxiety or pain. He will minister to your heart to heal it. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Christ personally resides in our heart as a helper to enable us to face life with joy and gladness. Whether it is sickness or natural disaster, Jesus is there through the ministry of His Spirit by our side. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit does in times of sorrow and disappointment. I was holding a satellite evangelistic campaign in Los Angeles, California. We were having two series, two sessions a night, one at 5 o'clock and one at 7.30. Often our meetings would get over about 6.30 and I would come with our crew, eat a little soup, some bread, get ready for the next session. One night I was eating and Somebody said, Pastor Mark, come quick. Come back to the sound booth. And I went back to the sound booth. And our sound engineer, Eddie Pullen, had slumped over and fallen on the floor. Immediately we detected it was a heart attack. We called 911 between this first and second session of the satellite uplink. We rushed Eddie to the hospital. After the meeting, we went to visit him and visit him a couple of days. He seemed to be doing well, needed an angioplasty which is a method in which you clean out some of the cholesterol that's pl plaqued in the arteries. As they were wheeling him to that, he had a massive heart attack and died. I was called immediately and Eddie's son and his wife were standing there in the operating room with Eddie's dead body lying there. I walked in and put my arms around Donna and his boy and we wept together. 
as that sorrow deepened, I noticed something amazing happening in Donna's life. The Holy Spirit was giving her unusual strength. Unusual strength in the midst of the heart attack of her husband. Unusual strength in the midst of suffering and death. And I watched in the months and years to come how although that woman went through unusual sorrow, the Holy Spirit gave her a peace. The Holy Spirit gave her a joy. The Holy Spirit gave her an anticipation of the second coming of Christ. And I've thought so many times as I went through that experience from the first moments after his death until years later that no human amount of hope or optimism could have done for that man's wife what the Holy Spirit did. God's Holy Spirit is there by our side as a what? As a helper. In discouragement, in failure, in disappointment, in guilt, in weakness, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, it's necessary for you that I go away. I can only be in one place at one time, but I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to the heart of every believer. And every believer, Peter, James, and John, will have those intimate moments like me, just as you had when you were on the mountain. Every believer will have that opportunity of having me by their side as their helper. Just as Jesus Christ was by the side of Peter, James, and John as a divine helper and encourager. He is by your side and mine through the ministry of the Holy Spirit as He lives within us. John 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and He'll give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Now the Latin word for comfort comes from two words, come meaning with and fortis meaning strengthen. So Jesus said, I am your helper and I am the one who strengthens you. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit not only comforts, not only does he, he, he help and comfort, but he is the one who gives us hope and transforms our lives. Christ Object Lessons, page 96, reading together. None are so vile. None have fallen so low as to be beyond the working of this Holy Spirit's power. In all who will submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The image of God is to be restored where? In humanity. So the Holy Spirit is there as our helper. He's there to strengthen us. None are so vile. None have fallen so low. There may be somebody here tonight that you're thinking, there's no hope for me. I've failed again and again and again. There is no hope. None are so vile. None have fallen so low that they are behind the Holy Spirit's what? Power in all who will do what? Who will do what? Who will do what? Will you submit? Will you submit? As a, one person will, thank God. Is your heart open to submit? Will you say, Jesus, I want to submit myself to your power. I cannot control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must control me. I can't tell the Holy Spirit what I want Him to do with my life. Do you know why so few people are filled with the Holy Spirit? Because so few people will allow the Holy Spirit to control their life. So few people will come and say, Jesus, I want to be totally, absolutely under control of Your Spirit. Whatever that means, whatever that means me giving up, Whatever that means me surrendering. Lord, I want to be totally under the control of Your Spirit. Lord, break my heart. I want a new principle to be implanted in my life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, an entire change can be made in your life. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Ho he strengthens us. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. John 14, verse 17, How be it He, when the Spirit of truth has come, He'll guide you into all truth. What does that mean, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you into truth? First, He'll guide you into truth about yourself. There's somebody here tonight that you have low self-esteem. You're pretty discouraged. You don't think you're worth very much. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says He'll guide you into all truth. One truth is, one divine truth is that you're worth something to God. One divine truth is that God loves you and He wants to save you and He won't let you be lost if you give your life to Him. Let the Holy Spirit guide you into that truth. Maybe you're here at camp meeting 
and you've been studying the Bible with a friend, and they brought you to this camp meeting, and you're weighing out whether the things that you have been studying are true or not, whether the Sabbath is true, whether the, the concept of death that you've been studying about in the Bible is true. Open your heart when you're here at camp meeting and say, Jesus, you promised to send me the Holy Spirit to guide me into truth, and I'm here, Lord, and I want to know truth. Maybe you are thinking about a job change. Maybe you're thinking about something else in your life. Let the Holy Spirit be the one that is your guide. Whatever He hears, He'll speak. He'll tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you things from eternity. He will reveal to you a direction, a purpose in your life. He will lead you back into an understanding of God's Word. If you've been struggling with understanding the Bible, open your heart to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I want really to know what you want me to... to I, I really want to see you out of your Word. I want your love to jump off the pages. I want your truth to jump off the pages. If you've been struggling with the Bible as you've studied it, if the Bible to you has become a book that is more boring and you kind of fall asleep, and open your heart to the Holy Spirit and say, Jesus... I want to know your will. I want the Bible to be fresh and meaningful to me. Steps to Christ, page 110. We can attain to an understanding of God's Word only through the illumination of that Spirit by which the Word was given. If you want the Bible to be a new book to you, if you want the Bible to be a book that is so interesting you can't wait to study it every day, get on your knees and say, Jesus, I need your Holy Spirit to make the Bible more interesting to me, to make it more exciting to me. The same Holy Spirit which reveals truth, reveals truth as we study His Word. The same Holy Spirit that came to the prophets of old. It's that same Holy Spirit that comes to us. Oh Lord, whatever truth You have for me, I desire it. Whatever changes You want in my life, Lord, I want those changes. Oh divine heavenly dove, come and instruct me. Can you pray that prayer with me tonight? Let's read it together off the screen as a prayer. Oh Lord, whatever truth You have for me, I desire it. Whatever changes You want for my life, I want them. Oh divine heavenly dove, come and instruct me. Is that your prayer tonight? God pours out His Holy Spirit on those whose hearts who long to obey Him. If you harbor secret sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you, but He will not fill you. If there's some secret sin in your life, something that you want nobody else to know, some practice in your life that you know is not in harmony with God's will, the Spirit will convict you, but He will not fill you. That does not mean that the Holy Spirit fills those only who have victory. It does mean that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, gradually gives us victory, and as we open our hearts and say, God, I don't want to harbor any sin. The Christian may fail, but he is not a failure. The Christian may sin, but he's not in bondage to sin. The Christian, for the Christian, sin is always an accident. It's something he doesn't intend, doesn't want. It's something he loathes, he hates, he abhors. For, for the Christian, we say, Jesus, I want only to do what you want me to do in life. I only want to please you. I don't want to harbor any secret sin in my life. When we come to Jesus and open our hearts so fully, He fills us in ways we can never imagine. The true vicar of Christ on earth does not sit on the Tiber River in Rome. The true vicar of Christ on earth is the Holy Spirit sent not from a throne in Rome, but from the throne room of the universe as our teacher, instructor in all truth. What do you say? It's the Holy Spirit that's the vicar of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that's the teacher of truth. It's the Holy Spirit that instructs us. The Holy Spirit's our helper. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our personal guide in decision making in the processes of life. There's somebody here today that you're thinking of a job change. There's some pastor that you have a call and you're thinking about whether you should take it. There's somebody here tonight that you are thinking whether you should move. There's somebody here tonight thinking, should I sell my house? There's somebody here tonight that you have some decision you have to make. Some young person thinking about a decision about marriage. Thank God 
we are not alone in the decision-making process. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11, reading together. The Lord will guide you what? Continually. He guides us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's our helper. The Holy Spirit's our comforter. The Holy Spirit's our divine teacher. The Holy Spirit is our guide. Psalm 32, verse 8. Through His Spirit, He says, I will instruct you and teach you that the way that you should go, I'll guide you with your eye. If you have to make some decision tonight, when you go home, get on your knees and say, Dear Jesus, send me your Spirit. Dear Jesus, convict me by your Spirit. God leads us through His Holy Spirit. Acts of the Apostles, page 49. The promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or race. Christ declared that the divine influence of His Spirit was to be with His followers until when? The end of time. You see, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not limited to the disciples. But if the Holy Spirit is available to us all, why are we so powerless? If Jesus has promised the Holy Spirit, Luke 11, verse 13, reading together, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the, your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask, will Jesus give you His Spirit? Will He do that? When will He do it? If we ask. If we ask. So coming to Him, saying, Jesus, I need Your help. Come along my side as the divine helper. Lord, I need Your comfort. Lord, I need Your strength. Lord, I need your wisdom. Lord, come through the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Apostles, page 50, reading together. If all were willing. Are you willing? How many of you are willing? If all were willing, what does it say? All. What is all? All would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you believe the promises that come from God's divinely anointed servant? If all were willing, all would be filled with the Holy Spirit. But if we do not appreciate heaven's most precious gift, He will not give it. When the Holy Spirit is casually mentioned and not seriously sought, God does not violate our freedom of choice. Acts of the Apostles, page 50. The lapse of time hasn't wrought any change in the parting promise to send the Holy Spirit. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of His grace do not flow earthward to men. God in heaven tonight wants to pour out His Spirit on your life and on this camp meeting in ways that we cannot imagine. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. Oh, Jesus, help me not think lightly of Your promise of the Holy Spirit. Help me not treat the third person of the Godhead casually. Jesus, if You want to have a more intimate experience with me than I can possibly imagine, more intimate than if I were one of Your disciples, I want that, Lord. If you want Jesus to give me more joy, more fulfillment, more satisfaction, more peace, Lord, I want that. Lord, all I want is to say, have your own way in my life. Adelaide Pollard was deeply discouraged. She was a missionary from Africa. All of her life, she longed for and wanted to be a missionary. She had left Africa because she ran out of funds. She was part of a denomination where missionaries had to raise their own salary. She came back to England to raise the money. She was there a month, two months, six months, a year. She, it didn't look good. The churches seemed to be bathed in materialism and nobody wanted to sponsor her. She was at a prayer meeting one night and as she was kneeling down, an elderly woman prayed, Oh Lord, give me health. Another man prayed, Oh Lord, give me money. I need more money, Lord. My business isn't doing well. Somebody else prayed, Oh Lord, I'm not married. Give me a 
husband, Lord. Everybody that prayed wanted something for themselves. And then there was an old woman in her late 80s. Her voice was quivering. Her hands were shaking. And the old woman began to pray. Lord, Lord, I don't want to ask You for anything. Lord, I just want to say, have Your own way with my life. And Adelaide Pollard went home that night. And with tears running down her face, she sat down with her pen and she began to write. And she wrote these words, Have Thine own way, Lord. Have Thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with Thy Spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. And in the quietness, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Have you been discouraged? Simply say, Jesus, fill my heart with your Holy Spirit. Give me a new courage. Jesus is going to touch somebody right now. The Holy Spirit's going to move in some heart right now. You know, the prophet of God says that the Holy Spirit can be falling on hearts all around you, and you might not even know it. She says that camp meetings are the time for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Have you felt weak? Some sin you're struggling with. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of that sin right now. Nobody else may see what's happening in your heart, but God will work through His Holy Spirit. He'll bring deep conviction of that sin, and He'll give you strength. Maybe there's somebody here that you've been struggling on the same thing again and again. Just now give it up. Surrender it to Him. Let His Holy Spirit give you power. Maybe you're faced with some decision, a decision in your life that you're at the crossroads and you don't know which way to turn. Ask Him for His Spirit just now to give you guidance. Say, Jesus, guide me by Your Spirit. Have Your own way in my life. Maybe right now, you need power as a witness for Jesus. You've tried witnessing, but you haven't been very successful at it. Only God knows success. But you need more of His Spirit. Ask Him for that Spirit. Just momentarily now. Speak to Jesus. Ask Him to fill you with His Spirit. Ask Him to give you the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace. Self-control and long-suffering and meekness and gentleness. Just now take a moment to pray. Father, we sense Your presence. We sense Your moving in this place. We believe You're here. We believe You're filling hearts. Where there are heavy burdens, You're lifting them. Where there is weakness, You're giving new strength. Where we've fallen, You've lifted us up. Where we've been weak and timid about our witness, You're giving us courage. All we can say is thank You, Jesus. Thank You for the gift of Your Spirit. Thank You that You're here with us tonight. Send us from this place with a renewed desire to seek You for the continued infilling. In Christ's name, Amen. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. If you have been blessed by this media, you may want to consider a donation to help support our efforts to spread these important and timely messages. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our media center at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, that's A-D-A, Michigan, 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. 
You can also listen to much of our media for free at our online media center at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.